Mr. Devine, Tracy Gillespie, and a couple of reenactors. It's 10 o'clock and there's still cars coming in. for the last couple of months with the Northern Virginia Regional Park Authority, which owns and operates this site. And we do have someone here representing the Park Authority, that's Jeff Randolph. And if you have any questions about the future of this site, um, there are a lot of plans in, in the making, a parking lot and some interpretive signs and a lot of other things to come in the future. And you may want to um, pull him aside after our program and see what's, what's going to be happening. <coughs> I'm going to introduce... Um, the gentlemen who are going to be uh, giving the program this morning, I'm going to be reading a few things, but uh, most of the program is going to be handled by these uh, other gentlemen. Of course, we have uh, two soldiers with us this morning, and they're um, not going to kill each other, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. These two gentlemen are both volunteers with the Loud Museum, and they are um, very active in living history. Um, not only here in the community, but really um, in, a, in a lot of places uh, near and far. We've got uh, Joe Holberg with us and also Doug Smith, um, and they'll be taking part in, in a few of the things this morning. And to lead our program today, we um, are very honored to have with us um, quite an expert on the Civil War here in Loudoun County. John Devine has uh, written several books on Loudoun County and the Civil War and the men from this area who fought in the war. Um, and he's been, uh, I think, instrumental in um, uncovering the history of Ball's Bluff and uh, publishing that as well. He's been very helpful um, with uh, a lot of Civil War programs and events at the museum. We've had him speak out here before, and you're in for a treat. It really, I think, will be a, a good program. So I'll turn things over to John. I'm the only fake here today. These two gentlemen here have authentic weapons and authentic uniform, so I am the only one in here that does have any credentials. Welcome to this day. And the good Lord and Mother Nature cooperate with us. We have one of the best days we've ever had. Some days it's been cloudy overcast, some days it's been too hot. I was just saying a few moments ago, I noticed all of you stood out here for the sun gets you. Ordinarily, we have to get back here too hot on the thing. Well, welcome anyway to Loudoun's largest battle, if you could call it a battle. It's almost a misnomer. Uh, there are some handouts here showing the number of troops here. There were only about 1,700 on either side. What possibly made or gave them impetus uh, to this engagement, I won't even say a battle, was the fact that the four <coughs> Union regiments here came from the three most populous cities on the East Coast. The 15th and 20th Massachusetts came from the Boston area. The 42nd Tammany Regiment came from New York City. And the 71st Pennsylvania came from Philadelphia. It was early in the war. Uh, news of the war uh, excited everyone. So the big newspapers of those three of the largest cities on the East Coast had their correspondence here. There was much written about it. Also, as Tracy will follow up after a little while, uh, particularly the 15th and 20th Mass were very literate men, and she will 
give you some names uh, after a while that you would recognize as being the uh, Blue Blood Society of New England. Uh, this was the first engagement for any of these Union troops. The Confederate troops had been blooded earlier, 90 days before this, over at First Manassas. But, as again I say, that what made this so important or brought it to the, to the attention of everybody, the newspaper men that were following and writing about it. Uh, it was a real tobacco here since the Union forces lost 50% of their men. Not many engagement did anyone lose 50% of it. To give a little uh, background before this particular day, the war was young. This was exactly three months after the first Battle of Manassas, which was July 21st, 1861, that it resulted in a Confederate victory there and the Union forces dropping back into Washington, D.C. General George B. McClellan had had some success over in the mountains of Western Virginia, and he was called to Washington to reorganize the scattered troops that then were beginning to pour into Washington. McClellan, regardless of what you may think of him, his, uh, his battlefield tactics not too successful. He was a good organizer. Quickly, he had organized the scattered units that had come back from uh, Manassas Battlefield, plus the fact that the new troops that were pouring into Washington. Quickly, he organized three divisions. Two of them he put on the Virginia side, <coughs> one at the Long Bridge, which is present day uh, 14th Street Bridge or a Highway Bridge, and one up at Chain Bridge. Then on the Maryland side, he had scattered troops starting at Great Falls, from Great <coughs> Falls clear to Corner Rocks. The division that we will be most concerned with here today will be General Charles P. Stone, with headquarters over at Poolsville, and after a little while we will take you out here and you can see Poolsville, or at least see the, the water tank sticking up on the, on the horizon. Uh, some, I, I think it would be appropriate to introduce to you some of the people here that first, uh, that first day. All the Union people were green, with few exceptions, without any military experience, without the battle. I'm going to ask Tracy to give you just a, a thumbnail sketch, and you can picture in your own mind uh, what they may have been facing here that day. Yeah, the, okay. the Union and then um, the Confederate. I'll read the, the Union ones first. Uh, we've got Isaac Wistar, who's uh, born in 1827. He's a law partner in California of uh, Colonel Baker, who we'll hear more of later. Uh, he raised a company for the 71st Pennsylvania and then recruited the regiment. Made a lieutenant colonel um, who was in the Peninsula uh, campaign in Antietam as well. Made a brigadier general in March 1863. I might add one point with this. I like this story. He came from a very prominent Philadelphia family, and he and Baker had been friends in California. <coughs> and Baker was given a commission to raise a regiment, so he went to Philadelphia and enlisted his old friend Isaac Wister to uh, raise the regiment for him. And in writing, he made this comment. He said that uh, Rome has long been associated uh, with patriotism. So at a great deal of personal expense, he visited the bars around Philadelphia and bought the room, and by the time they sobered up, he had many of them enlisted in the second question. William Raymond Lee, classmate of Jefferson Davis at West Point, um, born in 1828 as a civil engineer. Uh, he was captured at Ball's Bluff at Smart's Mill and released in May of 1862, uh, mustered out and resigned in December of 1862. He was the colonel of the 20th Mass, Harvard Regiment. He, uh, he, at this time, say he graduated from West Point in 1828. Uh, age was beginning to catch up with him. He could 
not to get up, hard to get up and down the bluff here, and that did lead to his capture after. Uh, Charles Devins um, went to Harvard Law School um, in the 15th Mass. Um, he was a kind of <laughs> reacher, right? <laughs> Um, in Chancellorsville, he was in the first division of Howard's Corps and was destroyed by the Confederates. He was the Attorney General um, under the work of the King and died in 1891. He was a warrior and without any military experience, and he really should not have been here on the field, but he did play a very active part here, and that was uh, one of the reasons that this part of the was successful. Milton Cogswell in the West Point class of 1849 served with the Dragoons on the frontier. Colonel of 42nd New York Tammany Regiment. He was captured at Ball's Bluff and released in 1862. He was the best soldier on the field. He was a regular. He was a West Pointer. He had served in the West and he was the best soldier on the field that nobody would listen to. Edward Dickinson Baker was born in England in 1808, came to Philadelphia in 1815. He was elected to Congress uh, from Illinois in 1846 and 1849. In Mexico, he was with the 4th Illinois Volunteer, uh, commanded Shields Brigade, uh, went on to California in 1852. In 1859, in Oregon, he became um, a state senator. Um, at the outbreak of war, President Lincoln gave him a uh, commandment to raise uh, a regiment, appealed to the old law partner, Isaac Wister, who had just talked about, for troops in Pennsylvania, and they called the regiment the First California. He was killed here at Ball's Bluff on the 21st of October, uh, about 5 o'clock in the afternoon. He had um, run for senator in California in 1855 and 1859, but had been defeated. That's when he went on to Oregon. Um, and he had helped Lincoln to carry California and Oregon in 1860 with the slogan, free men, free speech, and free dumb. dumb. Freedom. <laughs> he, um, as John will tell you, was a very good friend of uh, Abraham Lincoln. We'll have much more to say about him. Uh, Charles P. Stone, West Point class of 1845, was in the Mexican War as well. He became an engineer, resigned from the Army re-entered in 1861 and was made Inspector General for the District of Columbia. He was charged with the safety of the President-elect, Abraham Lincoln. When McClellan came to command, he made him Brigadier General with a brigade along the Potomac, and then at the same rank, he was, uh, led a division stationed at Poolsville, Maryland. We'll have much, much more to say about the stone. He was one of the central characters in there. Um, on to our Confederates. We've got uh, Nathan, George Nathan Shanks Evans, West Point class of 1848. He was born in 1824 in South Carolina, served in the West as a dragoon and a cavalryman. He was at First Manassas, where he led a small brigade. He was somewhat of a hero as he detected and held up the advance of the Union turning movement there. Um, I'm sure that John will tell you a little bit more about his problem with alcohol that he yes. had. Um, he was in command here and handled his troops well. Um, transferred to South Carolina later and died in 1868. His nickname was Shank, the guy was still at West Point. He had such ugly, spindly legs, but that's where he picked up the uh, nickname of Shank. Winfield Scott Featherston, the colonel of the 17th Mississippi, born in Tennessee. At age 17, he fought the Creek War. He read law, was elected to Congress in 1847, where he served for four years. In March of 1862, he was made Brigadier General and transferred to the West. He returned to law practice after the war and went into politics becoming a judge in 1882 and dying in 1891. Now, as you entered, the developer out here apparently was not a Civil War buff. He named one of the streets and he called it Featherstone, S-T-O-N-E, that E does not belong on it. It's Featherstone. Notice it on the way out. <laughs> uh, Colonel 